Hi there and welcome. I'm Dwayne Yergis. On Instagram, I'm DJ the Model Maker. Some of the people that follow me on social media have been asking me a lot of questions about the Minuteman silo model I've been building. So I want to take you on a uh, virtual tour of a Minuteman 3 missile silo to answer some of those questions. I was in the Air Force in the early 80s, assigned to the 341st Missile Wing at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Great Falls, Montana. Uh, the base is named after Einar Axel Malmstrom. I, I think that may be Swedish. Um, oh, that's me in boot camp. That's not Einar. Um, Einar was a colonel in World War II. Um, anyway, my, my job was to work on the Minuteman III weapon system. Primarily to keep uh, all the electronic equipment up and running. Um, because of the sensitive uh, nature of the job, I held a top secret clearance. Top secret clearance. Anytime a missile was off alert status, the Strategic Air Command, or SAC, um, headquarters, knew about it, and getting that missile back on alert status was number one priority. I was the team chief of a maintenance team. It's not as impressive as it sounds. It's really not that impressive. There, there were only two of us. Um, our designation was SS-23, SS Site Security, I think is what that stood for. Um, it was me and a teammate. And then we always traveled with two armed guards. Um, uh, me and my teammate worked inside the silo while the guards remained topside to patrol the perimeter fence and keep an eye out for possible threats. Uh, the guards weren't allowed inside the silo. Is this what you were thinking when I said Minuteman Missile Site? Good guess, but no. Is this what you were thinking when I said Minuteman Missile Site? Yes? <laughs> then tell them what they've won, Jay. You've won a no-expense-paid trip to the frozen plains of Montana where you will be forced to endure freezing temperatures and possibly frostbite. So here's what a launch facility, or LF, looks like if you were just driving down some country road in Montana. Yeah, I know. Uh, don't tell anyone. It's a secret. All the launch facilities are unmanned, except when maintenance is needed, of course, but... Um, not a lot to look at. In fact, you might even miss it if you weren't looking for it. Even less impressive in the winter. Uh, temperatures in the winter can drop well below zero. And wind chill, you get down to minus 50 or minus 60. Around the site was a chain link fence to keep everything out. Cows, people, whatever. Signs posted frequently on the fence gave you the idea that maybe this wasn't just a farmer's corral or a place to secure a tractor. Like I said, everything's underground. So one launch control facility, or LCF, uh, this is where the officers turn the keys to launch the missiles. Uh, they would monitor 10 missiles, but if needed, they could control other groups of missiles. Uh, so, in, at Malmstrom Air Force Base, uh, the Minuteman 3 missiles, there were both Minuteman 2 and Minuteman 3, um, each group of 10 missiles controlled by one launch control facility, and they were identified by a letter of the alphabet and a number. Now, I know what you're thinking. Is this really necessary? Well, the answer is probably not, but this is how they did it. A through O were designations for Minuteman 2 missiles, and letters P, Q, R, S, T were designated for Minuteman three missiles. Using the military phonetics, that is Papa, Quebec, Romeo, Sierra, Tango. So the launch control facility for the Papa group of 10 missiles was called Papa Zero. Its 10 missiles were Papa one, two, three, all the way up to 10. The next group was Quebec, so Quebec Zero for the Launch Control Facility. 
the numbers didn't reset to 1, but kept incrementing. So Quebec 11, Quebec 12, and so on. And then Romeo, uh, Romeo 21, Romeo 22, and then eventually um, Sierra, Tango, and then Tango 50 was the last one in the, in the series. So there were, in total, there were 200 launch facilities, each with a missile in them, and 20 launch control facilities. Okay, let's take a look at an artist's drawing of a launch facility. Uh, there are two main sections here. Uh, the equipment building, which is actually much farther underground than it looks here uh, in the silo. The equipment building housed uh, environmental controls to keep the silo at a specific temperature and humidity um, and a diesel generator to supply power to the silo in the event of the loss of commercial power. As the diesel generator was firing up, the internal batteries would supply power. Uh, the site could be powered on batteries for up to <laughs> okay yeah yeah i understand okay i've been notified that if i do that again i get in serious trouble so evidently that's still uh, classified so moving on so the silo was comprised of the launch tube and the upper and lower equipment rooms. In this drawing, the silo appears to stop where the equipment room begins. It actually extends all the way to ground level, but they left that out so you could see, I guess. Uh, the launch tube is a thousand inches from top to bottom. That's 83.3 feet. You know, did the designers just round off to the nearest thousand or how did that work, I wonder? Uh, near the, towards the bottom of the, the launch tube is the uh, missile suspension system. And this holds the missile in place. It is suspended on heavy duty cables. Uh, the missile itself weighs in at just under 80,000 pounds. A fully loaded semi truck on the highway is about 80,000 pounds. Uh, the suspension system probably weighs I don't know, 10 or 12,000 pounds. So those cables got to support uh, quite a bit of weight. But being suspended like this, it gets to move a little in the event of a nearby detonation of a Soviet warhead or whatever, giving, it, uh, giving the missile a much higher survivability rate and still being able to be launched. So the walls of the entire facility are thick, borated concrete and steel. Uh, boron is added to the concrete to shield the silo from radiation. Building the launch facilities tough enough to withstand uh, a nearby nuclear blast also made it uh, nearly impossible to be broken into by someone wanting to destroy, steal, launch the missile, a warhead, whatever. Every launch facility was at least three nautical miles away from any other launch facility or launch control facility. Around the launch tube is the donut shaped equipment room, upper level, lower level, and all this equipment is needed to keep the missile on alert status. All of the systems are monitored and anytime a fault is detected, a warning light tells the capsule crew, the, the guys who turn the keys, about that fault. And then the capsule crew can run some tests and report the fault back to base. Then a crew is dispatched to deal with that fault. And I was one of those crews that went out to the launch facilities to fix the faults. So here we see the personnel access hatch, or the PAH, uh, this is the only way to get into the facility without a cutting torch and a jackhammer and a lot of time. Uh, all the equipment in the upper and lower equipment rooms is designed to fit through this hatchway. Uh, here we see a crew opening up the hatch. Um, wow, that's unusual. A tech sergeant is cranking the door open. That's unusual. Um, the door on top weighs about 1,200 pounds. So it's not an easy thing to do. 
this top hatch is the first point of entry. Uh, inside the access way is a plug that raises and lowers uh, to plug the opening, and they call it the B plug. Uh, it's made of steel and concrete, weighs about 10,000 pounds. So, yeah, you're not going to get through that thing easily. Uh, here we see it in the up and locked position. After dialing the correct combination on one of the two dials, there's two there in case one fails, you turn that little T handle that's right next to it and uh, it retracts the large locking pins uh, and then you go up top side, flip a switch, and it starts a timer. After the timer expires, then the B plug starts to lower itself at a painfully slow rate uh, and then eventually you gain access to the silo. Um, all this time is needed to get into the site. That was designed that way, so if an unauthorized person tried to access the site, a team of armed persons uh, would have time to get to the site. Each uh, launch control facility had multiple teams on standby at all times, uh, so they weren't at the base, they were out there in the field. Uh, the B plug could be lowered uh, to allow access and raise to, to fill, it up, fill up that opening. Uh, looking up from the bottom, you might get a little claustrophobic, but, you know, it's just the way they built it. Um, and then uh, here we see um, a B plug with the uh, bottom cover removed. You can see all of those large pins. Um, and then here's a view of one uh, from the top. It's all nice and clean. Um, so, yeah, it was uh, an interesting place to work and an interesting job. And so, yeah, hope you enjoyed a little tour of a uh, silo. So I'm building this model in 148th scale. Um, <clears throat> it's not easy to find uh, all the bits and pieces needed, so... I decided I would buy a 3D printer. I bought the Ender 3D Pro or something like that. Uh, it's turning out to be uh, really fun and creative. So anyway, in the future, I'll uh, maybe put some more videos up of all the different methods and things I'm doing to make this uh, come to life. So anyway, thanks for watching and uh, look for some more videos in the future.